As you must already have noticed, this channel has a very standard format. You are here to see coins and I show them to you. And instead of simply showing them in full screen, I actually sacrifice a bit of space that could be occupied for more coin so you can see my hand, which helps you have a better idea of how big the coin is against an easily recognizable reference, which is my hand. So today we're getting closer to our coins, much closer. Almost as if looking at it through a microscope. I have partnered up with a friend and fellow collector. He owns the website called The Artemis Collection. Links will be in the description down below. And has kindly allowed me to show you his collection and his very high resolution pictures. So we can look at the microcosmos of our coins. So let's take a look at them. And how about we start with something immediately recognizable by everyone. The Athenian Tetadrachma. The first thing that calls my attention is the high relief of these coins, and you can appreciate it even better when you actually zoom in. Let's start from Athena's lips and move to her helmet. As you can see, the relief of the coin is nearly as thick as the flint itself, and as we hit the point between her cheeks and her hair, we once again see how much of a volume the hair has. This is the kind of coin that the more you look at it, the more small details and interesting things you start noticing. And since we're close to the helmet, here's a curious little thing. Here we have corrosion spots. Silver is quite stable chemically, but it isn't invincible. Some few chemicals have the potential to damage it, particularly modern chemicals such as fertilizers are particularly nasty to silver. It's almost like the helmet is filled with these tiny little craters and fertilizers might be the culprit. When heading to the reverse, we are greeted with the owl which also pops up just as much as Athena. The smaller feathers at the owl's body are too small to be individually sculpted, so the engraver decided instead to just add little dots. As we move to the rim, we can see the sort of scar that the minting process left on these coins. The flan would be heated up, which would make the metal softer, and the hammer bow blow quickly displaced the metal, which took the shape of the design. However, on the edges of the die, there was no design to be imprinted, so we can see these lines which show how the silver flowed, sort of like slipped to the sides, sliding from the tip of the die outwards. And for last, this kind of coin allows us to appreciate how engravers would make the letters. Let's focus on the alpha letter here. Greek coins in particular have these little balls or dots in some letters. These were added first, so you can think about the engraver making a little point, and the engraver this way would have a point of reference where to make the letter. He then must have made another line which went all the way to the edge of the design, as you can see, then another one which would go to the owl's cheek, and finally the last line that connected and made the A. So from Greek silver let's go to Roman bronze. This is an ass struck under Augustus but celebrating his friend and general, Agrippa with a lovely style for the bust, so let's head a bit closer. The first thing that calls my attention is the near lack of flow lines compared to the previous coin. Bronze and copper was, were much stiffer and less malleable than silver, so copper tends to have less flow marks in general. Bronze is also way more reactive than silver. Look how many different colors we find here. Bronze patina can be of one color or multicolor like this one. Each patch is the result of different chemicals in the soil reacting to the copper and creating different kinds of mineral layers. The same thing can be said when going to the reverse. This is not a color of patina you actually see very often. Red. You see a lot of brown, but red it's less common. This coin must have been exposed to soil on one side and some object made out of a different material on the other side.
All right, next. Let's head to Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> wow, this is a beautiful coin. The flint must have been fantastically hot when this coin was struck. The metal, as a result, becomes even more fluid, almost like clay, and the hammer strike results in these very dramatic flow lines. It's almost like a little explosion coming from the bust. And since we're looking at the outer edges of the coin to appreciate the flow lines, look how the small crevices where the flan connects to the bust are changing colors. This is the birth of silver Tony. These small areas tend to accumulate residue through time and generally are the first to tone. This toning will then radiate outwards and spread all over the coin. Let's zoom out a bit and appreciate the bust. The Denarius is a small coin, so sometimes they don't have very high relief. This one does, however. You can see how Marcus's face, particularly so his eyes and hair, pop out quite significantly. Great coin, frankly, I'm jealous of the owner. Okay, how about another Greek coin? Let's look at a D drachma from Neapolis. If the previous coin had the beginning of Tony forming up, here we have a much more advanced process. If you give a coin enough time, and have a fair bit of luck, you can be rewarded with this, a lovely rainbow toning spreading all over the lower parts of the piece in an explosion of different colors. This piece must have been in a cabinet or stored somewhere for quite some time. Not only the toning has started to form on the field, but also the smaller crevices on the higher points of the coin. So from a rainbow tone, we go to bright red. This coin looks like it came straight from hell. This is an Antoninianus from Emperor Aurelian. These coins were originally a 5% silver coin covered in a thin silvering layer. So it did not look like this originally. So well, what happened to this coin? Well, it's silvering as typical wore off long ago. It must have developed a patina then, as we can see some darker spots on the coin, but for some reason the patina recently has been removed, leaving us with the core of the coin. At 95% copper in its composition, it's no surprise it looks bright red. In any case, even without its protective patina, this coin seems to be in gorgeous condition, with very minimal circulation wear. The ear and the high parts of the radiate crown are generally the first parts to wear off, and the first parts where you can see, okay, like this coin has circulated a little bit. But we can see separation between them, meaning this coin was probably stashed away as soon as it was minted. Heading to the lower parts of the obverse, near Aurelian's cuirass, we can see this rift going nearly to the middle of the coin. This is a flan crack. The metal didn't always resist the strength of the hammer blow, and sometimes a crack like this would form as a result of the stresses involved in the sudden shock of the hammer blow. As we head to the reverse, we see the image of the sun god, although it frankly looks like an alien to me. The crack I mentioned on the other side can also be seen here, also going all the way to nearly the middle of the coin. These coins were made in very vast numbers and they were made in a hurry by the engravers. So it's cool to see that this level of magn in this level of magnification, how they tried to save time in certain parts of the design since they had to come up with a lot of dice to keep up with production. So as we can see, for example, the hand, they didn't have time to make a full hand, so they just made two strokes. For the main features of the face, like the two lips, the eye and the nose, each one was also one quick stroke, among other cool little details. It's really nice to just take a moment and appreciate how the little, the little intricacies and the little designs were sculpted in this level of magnification. Okay, for the next one, what do we have here? This is a really cool coin. Do you notice something unusual with it? Why does this denarius have these eruption-like openings in it? Like if something was trying to, almost like trying to come out of it. That is because this is a fake coin. 
and not a modern fake made to fool collectors, but an ancient fake made to fool Romans. Let's head close to one of these openings. We can see the green and black from a copper core. This coin only had a very thin silver layer over it, which quickly peeled off, exposing the bare metal core. So this is basically what happened. The thin silver layer on top wasn't very stable. It was just a small sheet of silver put on top of it. So with time and circulation, it had the tendency to start fracturing because it didn't have a whole lot of physical stability. But what surprises me the most, it's not the fact that this is a fake because fakes were very common back in the day. What truly surprises me is that this coin looks exactly like the real thing. The quality of engraving is astonishing. This fake is not the result of a crude clandestine workshop making fake coins. This was very likely made by an official engraver, someone who worked at the mint, who wanted to make a little extra by faking coins, or who knows, maybe even a set of dice stolen from the mint. So, as I said, this is a very high quality fake. This kind of small details and quality required a skilled craftsman. So, this is really cool. This could be the material testimony of a corrupt mint worker working at the Imperial Mint during Hadrian's reign. So, we just looked at a Roman. How about another Greek one? Let's head over to our lovely Syracuse, famous for the quality of its coinage, all the way down to the humble bronze pieces. So on the obverse of this one, we have this lovely feminine bust looking left. Really great engraving work here. Even small details like the lips are quite well made. The coin is all covered in quite a thick green patina, and we can still read the Syracusion from the Syracusans. What calls me attention the most in this coin, however, are these holes. Quite unusual, huh? These are, this is called pitting, and unfortunately it's all too common on bronze coins. They are just prone to corrosion every now and then. If we zoom in on the hole next to the cheek, for example, we can see that it corroded all the way down to the bottom of the, of the thick patina, and right at the center we can see a little bit of the bare metal. This coin could have had bronze disease at these holes at some moment, but if we scan around other holes, it seems like this is not the case anymore, which is a relief. A lot of people fear bronze disease, but fortunately it can be treated. It's just not something very easy to achieve, frankly. If you have a coin with pitting, it doesn't mean it will mandatorily develop the disease, but it is a good idea to check the coin every now and then and always try to keep it in a dry environment. The river seems to have been less affected, showing a very healthy patina, and the charioteer retains quite a lot of detail. Also, do you see these two little tips at the op at opposite ends of the coin? That is part of the manufacturing process of the blanks. These would be cast in a mold that would have multiple blanks in a row, with a channel linking them so the molten metal could flow to all soon-to-be coins. After all blanks were cast, each coin to be would be separated, and you are left with these little tips on each end, which are just the remnants of this little channel. Some people prefer the coins perfectly round. Myself, on the other hand, I quite like it. It, it gives the coin a rustic appearance, don't you think? Okay, who's next? That's another Roman coin. This is a provincial tetadrachma, struck under Philip the Arab. Probably one of the most common Roman tetadrachma out there. It's a big, chunky coin that is not very expensive and feels great on hand. Now, don't you think the color of this coin is actually a bit unusual? That's because it is. Let's zoom in a bit and see what causes it. You see, these coins had very low silver content, below 30% sometimes and the silvery appearance was achieved using some met metallurgy tricks that left the surface of the coin rich in silver compared to its core. But the problem is, as soon as the coin suffered a bit of wear or the outer layer suffered a bit of corrosion, the true nature of the alloy would be revealed. 
Copper and silver don't mix incredibly well. And as we approach the coin and look very closely, we can actually distinguish the little globules of silver and copper, as they don't mix fully. Looking from afar, it gives this odd gray and dull tone to the coin, but it's really cool to see the chemistry behind this effect when you get up close. In fact, if we head to the upper right corner of the, the obverse, the lower wreath as we can see, is definitely more coppery in the appearance, probably because of a little bit of wear. And as we head to the right field, we can see the true nature of the coin's inner alloy, which had way more copper than silver. A small loss of surface material leaves us with the dark red spot that clearly shows the base metal. Really cool, it shows that these coins were actually mostly copper. The river seems to be less affected by corrosion. We have this lovely ego dominating the design, and it still retains quite a silvery appearance. That is, until you get closer to the coin once again, and the red dots of copper start showing up once again. This silvering technique would be replicated throughout history. The Byzantines, the Arabs, the medieval kingdoms, all the way to the modern period. Similar silvering techniques were used to give low-value coins better appearance. And finally, for our last coin of the day, how about this little Greek coin here? This is a hemidrachma from Sinope. And look what an odd appearance it has. Let's take a closer look and investigate what is going on. What we have here is commonly called crystallization or embrittlement. This is a phenomenon that happens to parts of silver coins buried underground for long periods of time. It has mostly to do with the alloy of the silver coin when it was first minted and depending on the conditions it was buried in. I will not get into much of the details, but it has to do with the other chemical elements apart from silver. So if the coin had impurities, if it had other metals that were not silver, like copper or lead in its composition, and these metals, which are more reactive than silver, for some reason left the coin, as they reacted with other things in the environment throughout the millennia, this is what we have as a result, a globular appearance, which is, in reality are just a series of cracks where these other elements once sat in the coin, leaving a brittle coin of nearly pure silver. I am personally a strong advocate that you should be extremely careful with every single coin you own, but these are particularly susceptible to, to damage. Dropping this coin could very well lead to it shattering, not just cracking, but shattering like glass, which would be a shame. Look how interesting, Tone, toning is developing in the silver globules at the bust, resulting in this gold and silver contrast at the surface. The reverse is also a similar story. We have an ego at the center, which actually looks less crystallized than the rest of the coin. As we zoom in, we notice that the surfaces of the coin closer to the ego are actually healthier, with, with less gaps and cracks. We can also see how the flow lines when this coin was first struck are still visible in some areas. But as we move outwards, however, we notice that the cracks and the pitting start getting noticeable once again. So how did you like it? Did you know such intricate little details were hidden in plain sight in your coins? Because your coins probably have something similar to the stuff we've seen today. Do you have any coins with similar effects like the ones we've shown in detail here today? Let us know in the comment section down below. Once again, thank you very much for the Artemis collection for letting me share these coins with you today. Definitely check his collection out, there are plenty more coins to explore there, and it's a fascinating and very well curated collection. Links will be in the description down below. I hope you all enjoyed it, leave a like if you did, happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.